Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome, uh, welcome once again, everybody, to uh, to Terry Third Thursday. Thank you for making it out. You know, the summer is always a, a difficult time for folks. People are running different directions, and kids and camp and schools and vacations. But it's uh, your attendance is appreciated, and it's always nice to be able to come and spend the morning hearing interesting stories. Uh, certainly, from speakers like we have this morning, it's with uh, with great delight uh, that we have Mary here, and I look forward to, to her spending some time with you all, uh, with all of us, I should say, and being able to hear what's a really, really cool story. Um, but for those of you that don't know me, uh, I am Zach Dimming. I'm the Terry Third Thursday Chair. I'm extremely here, uh, extremely pleased, I should say, to be here this morning filling in for Dean Ayers, who is visiting alumni in Columbus, Georgia today. Welcome to Terry Third Thursday. Uh, welcome to the Teak. This is what we call this place, the Terry Executive Education Center, uh, the Terry Third Thursday event. For those of you who perhaps are first timers or perhaps even for our guests this morning, this is our monthly uh, breakfast event. Uh, this is also the TEAC, is our base operations here in Atlanta, serves as a place where alumni, students, classes, professional education, and a whole heck of a lot of networking and kind of uh, uh, interaction goes on right here in the heart of Atlanta. It takes an awful lot to organize Terry Third Thursday. These things don't happen by themselves, and I probably benefit as much as anyone uh, from our alumni board, the committee that helps me uh, put this on, uh, the nine members, and, uh, and our sponsors, uh, through which all of this is, is especially possible. So I'd like to, to recognize those. First and foremost, our, uh, our corporate sponsor, which is Bank of North Georgia. as well as our two media sponsors, which is the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and Public Broadcasting Atlanta, WABE. Join me in, in, in thanking these individuals as well. Um, upcoming, Terry Third Thursday speakers, just to go ahead and help hop on your calendars as best we can. We're not going to do a Terry Third Thursday next month. I opened by saying summer's a challenge, and Having done this an awful long time, boy, July is especially a challenge. So we're going to try something new this year. We're going to let everybody have a, a bit of a month off. But we are going to pick back up in August uh, with Troy Woods, chairman and CEO of, of TSIS. We're going to talk about Columbus and where Dean Ayers is today. TSIS is a, certainly an interesting organization. And September 15th, Steve Voorhees, CEO of West Rock, uh, will be with us then as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce this morning's speaker, chairman of the board, Chief Executive Officer of Veritiv Corporation, Mary Lashinger. Veritiv is a leading North American distribution solutions company. Mary is Georgia's first Fortune 500 female CEO. She has held many leadership roles prior to Veritiv. She was SVP of International Paper Company, president of the Expedex uh, distribution business. She was president of Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and Russia businesses at International Paper. She was VP and general manager for International Paper's wood products and pulp businesses, as well as many other senior management roles in sales, marketing, manufacturing, supply chain, all of the International Paper. Ms. Lashinger has also held various positions in product management and distribution at James River Corporation and at Kimberly Clark. She's a member of the board of directors of Kellogg Company. She serves on the audit and nominating and governance committees. She's a member of the Executive Committee for the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. Ms. Lashinger holds a bachelor's degree in the business, in business, I should say, from the University of Wisconsin and an MBA from the University of Connecticut. She's also completed postgraduate studies in executive management at Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. And now we'll kick off her presentation with a short video. Uh, so if you guys will stick with me just a second while this loads. Uh, but most importantly, um, We'll sit, we'll watch the video for a second, and then Mary will, or, will join us. Veritiv, a leading business-to-business -business distribution solutions company with distribution centers across North America. Veritiv, a vision of one team shaping success through exceptional service innovative people, and consistent value. Veritiv, a trusted partner to more than half of Fortune 500 companies. Veritiv, 
$8.7 billion in net sales in 2015. Behind it all, a motivated winning sales force committed to serving your needs. Veritive designs, sources, and delivers unmatched innovative solutions that help shape success for customers, suppliers, and shareholders. Quality, efficiency, expertise. Veritive. So this is, uh, this is really great, and um, I was telling Mary and her team, I came in very late last night from Vancouver, and as I was walking down the street in British Columbia, I'm at a stop sign or a stoplight at a cross street, and there in front of me is a, is a veritative truck. So I knew this was, <laughs> was, uh, was meant to be all the way, a heck of a long way from Atlanta. So please join me in welcoming Mary Lashinger. Her topic this morning is from new company to Georgia's newest Fortune 500 in two whole years. Mary. <laughs> Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and um, I'm really pleased that people showed up, um, you know, because uh, we're largely a, an unknown company. Um, but it's a great timing for us because um, as of last week, we did uh, hit the Fortune 500, company, uh, Fortune 500 list. Um, and, uh, you know, I characterize, um, you know, our business as a $9 billion startup company. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that and the challenges um, that, and the things that we've accomplished in a, in a very short term. But just a little more clarity about our business. Um, we are a distribution company in the simplest of terms. We buy products uh, from large manufacturers, many of them on the Fortune 500. Um, we, they sell us those products because we have reach to their customer base and we enable a better supply chain more cost effectively to reach those customers. And then we have a sales force of over 1,500 strong uh, with a lot of sales support people um, that enable that transaction and that interaction with our customers. And in addition to that, we've got an enormous supply chain network across North America that enhances the delivery to those customers. So we add value both to the supplier base in terms of providing customer reach and a more effective supply chain and to the customers in terms of providing um, the value of a one-stop shop for the products and services they're looking for and a more cost-effective supply chain and we bring our size and scale um, to that buy that they're making within their organization. We service uh, three primary segments, those customers that are looking to, um, that are printing materials, whether that be in um, advertising print media like direct mail you might receive in your mail every day and there's a lot of it, uh, magazines, catalogs, book publishing. Um, and so we do business with like the Time Warners of the world, um, AT&T, materials you get when you buy a, a phone and it's inserted into the box, um, or the advertisement you might get from um, Verizon or AT&T in your mail. We also um, are in the packaging space. Um, and so we provide a lot of services in our packaging space as well, where we literally design the package um, we source all the materials and deliver that package to the point of manufacture where they will put the product inside. Sometimes it's shelf-ready packaging and sometimes it's packaging needed to transport products. You know, some of the great customers we have in there are like the high-tech customers. So if you buy, you know, a phone or, or um, a computer, um, a lot of that packaging and the design and the structure of that packaging is what we designed, source the materials, and we supply those products as far as Asia and, and other places in order where the point of manufacture is and then sometimes facilitate the transport back into the U.S. And then we also have a facilities business where we're providing products that support facilities like this, large institutions where there's a lot of people coming and going and it's the products that they need, your coffee cups, you know, the stuff you need in the bathrooms, the things that they need to come, come uh, clean facilities, whether that's big theme parks, universities, um, and those types of um, venues. So that's a little bit about our business. You know, we came um, into existence in July of 2014. 
And it was a result of a spin of a company called Expedex out of International Paper, and it was a distribution company, a uh, division of International Paper. We spun it out of International Paper, um, uh, put it into a public company entity structure. We merged that, we merged a company by the name of Unisource, uh, which was owned by private equity, um, into that structure. We um, did a, an irregular, I call it IPO, became listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and started trading all in one day. And it has been quite a journey. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, and, and you know, these were uh, competitors one and two in the marketplace, remarkably similar um, in terms of their, their businesses. And um, you know, it has been quite a journey. And, and um, I was asked to be the CEO of this company back in the fall of 2012. It took us over two years to negotiate the transaction and put everything in place in order to, to pull off what we pulled off. Because it's not often um, that you have two really pu private companies and then taking them public all at one time and then going through an integration in the public environment. And um, so I had always envisioned that we had three primary phases of at least in the first five years of our, our, of our journey. And I talk about our journey a lot with our teams. And the first phase was to really to stand up a public company and stabilize our business. You know, imagine on, on day one, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a story, got great stories. I was recruiting our, our board of directors. So we had no board of directors. And so I had to recruit a board of directors for a company that didn't exist. And I had to provide that vision. I had to recruit a management team for a company that didn't exist, a CFO, a general counsel. And that was a year before we actually finalized the deal and we didn't even know if we'd be able to finish the transaction. But the board of directors, when I'd interview them, they said, what worries you the most? And I said, well, we're getting ready to launch a $9 billion public company, and I'm the only one out of over 8,000 employees who's ever worked as a senior executive in a public company. <laughs> and I thought, and when I say that, I get really scared. <laughs> <laughs> and so standing up the public company environment was really important to us. And, and just imagine, on day one, we weren't even able to do SEC financial reporting. We weren't SOX compliant. We didn't have a shareholder base. We just had recruited a board of directors. We had uh, a CFO, brand new CFO, a brand new general counsel, a brand new investor relations person, and we had a brand new management team and a brand new company and had no credibility in the markets because nobody knew us. And we had a new name which I felt was really important when we went into the market. Um, but, you know, and I can talk about where we are in a moment, but we did all of those things in a very short period of time, and the pace of change in getting that done is just remarkable in terms of what our teams had done. And at the same time, we needed to stabilize our business because we had been in negotiations for two years. Imagine the uncertainty with over 8,000 employees for two years when you've got number one and number two coming together as competitors. And I can tell you, prior to the merge, there was a lot of bad behavior going on, you know. <laughs> and, um, and so, and that really drove me to think about the culture of the company, which I'll come back and talk to. You know, so that was all in the first uh, few months of, of our existence. We immediately had to move into the second phase of our, of, our, of our history and our journey, which was to integrate and get synergies. We had done a lot of planning up front. Um, we'd made commitments to our investors pre-July 2014 for three years. And so we needed a massive integration plan and the synergies that went with that. But imagine, you know, we had to stand up a brand new organization structure, brand new leadership team for the whole organization. Um, we didn't have people systems uh, because uh, one company was part of international paper and we had to carve out the entire company. And so, um, you know, that was a whole year's worth of work we made a commitment on Workday as our, as our people system and um, to just to pay people. Think about that. We had to figure out how to pay people. Um, and so this was an enormous amount of work. And so it was all about the org structure, getting the right people in place, dealing with the systems and capabilities we needed to operate. Um, and, that, and we did all of that in the first six months. And then as we went into the second 12 months of our existence, we started focusing more on getting synergies and then the next phase of our integration, which is really where we are today. We're about halfway through our integration, and now we're focusing on things like our operational systems. 
you know, how do we get to a single order management system, a single warehouse management system, you know, all the things you need to do to run your company. Um, and, and then as we move out of that, we'll begin to optimizing our assets, you know, our, our buildings, our, all of our fixed cost structure, our inventories, all those things. And along the way, we've made financial commitments. And then I always had figured that as we come out of this, our third phase of the company would be to figure out how to accelerate and really begin to transform the company into the future of what we wanted to be. And we've already started staffing a team of people to help us figure that out so that as the time comes, as we come out of integration in 17 and 18, we'll be ready to do that and hope to talk more about it um, even later this year. So, um, you know, to date, um, we've delivered on our shareholder commitments. We've had seven quarters of reporting. We've either met or exceeded those commitments. Um, you know, we've got a very strong uh, investor base. Uh, more than 70% of our investors are value-added, value-based investors. Um, and so we're really proud of our investor base. Um, and I feel really proud of, of where we are from a people and a customer standpoint and really met, I believe we've met our, co our commitments um, to those constituencies as well. You know, as I reflect um, about, you know, what's the keys um, to our success, and, and I have to admit, when I went into this, it was a daunting um, task, for sure. Um, you know, and it, and it came down to a few things that I think we did very, very well. First and foremost, we selected the right people. Um, you know, I asked the organization, we had integration teams before day one, and I asked, I said, I want everyone in this company to know who they're reporting to on day one. You know, we had consultants helping us, and they looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, this is critically important because it's got to reduce the uncertainty in terms of our people. And so pre-day one, we, had, um, a, a, we knew what the organization structure was going to be. We, um, we had all of the organization in place for the top three to four layers of the organization pre-day one. And I met with every layer of that organization before they went and hired their teams. And we had two to three people slated for every job because we had two big companies. And I asked them, as they were choosing their people, I said, I want you to choose people based on this criteria and in this order. I want you to think about their value system first. First and foremost, their values. We need people who are gonna wanna work together. We need people that understand teamwork. They're gonna be able to collaborate. We need people that care about the enterprise, not just about themselves. They're going to care about their colleagues succeed, succeeding, not about just them succeeding. But it's all about this value system that we want to bring to the company to create our culture. I then asked them to think about individuals that had the capability and, most importantly, the willingness to learn and grow. Because I knew that we would be faced with massive change. And in order to be successful, we needed people that would be willing to learn, adapt, and change. And you can't teach that. People need to be willing to learn, adapt, and change. And then lastly, I asked them to hire for technical skills. Now, there's clearly some, some jobs where you need a certain level of technical expertise, but I believe you can get the first two with that as well. But first and foremost, values and willingness to learn and grow, because we can't teach those things. It has to be innate in the individual. But we can teach technical competencies and, and in some cases, leadership as well. We also um, had a very detailed execution plan with huge benchmarks, stretch goals, all the things that you would expect. We stood up an integration office. Um, the integration, um, head of integration was a direct report to me. Um, you know, and, and so there was a huge, massive integration plan. And it was all about timelines and getting people engaged in the execution. And, you know, we've met and exceeded our synergy targets to date and are right on track in terms of our integration. And then the last thing I think that really has helped us, and we've got a long ways to go on this, but it was about building our, our culture. And so in the first week of our new company coming together, I rolled out and introduced our values. And do, do we have them here someplace, our values? Yes. They're on the table. I don't know if we had a slide. They're on the table. But, you know, one of the things that I – that is absolutely out there statistically is, is that um, those 50% um, of mergers never achieve their full potential. And it's usually because they don't have a culture that people can connect with. And so I felt it was critically important to build a culture, not one of the two legacy cultures, because we were bringing two competitors together and we wanted this to be a team. 
And so building our culture was really important. And building it based on values, I believe, was going to be the right formula for success for us. And when you build a culture, and by the way, culture building isn't easy, I'm learning. Um, it's a lot of hard work, and people don't understand what it means to build a culture. And I tell people every day, it's not just about me building the culture, it's about all of us building the culture. And, and, it's, and it's doing everything we do, and, and when we put a process in place, we try to bring it back to what does it mean to our culture. For example, um, in the last year, we rolled out our performance management system. You know, how are we going to manage performance? Well, it's a big part of our people commitment. You know, if we're going to be a high-performing organization, we've got to be able to manage performance. And so we've got to give the tools. This year, we're rolling out our talent development tools. We have some people here from Corn Ferry. We're using the Lominger predecessor, which is now Corn Ferry, tools for talent development. We've got a whole organization that doesn't even understand what this is, but it's a huge commitment to be able to give the tools and start a talent development program in the process of integrating these two big companies. And so it's about building capabilities, processes, having the processes, the management systems, and the values, and then doing it every day and every day to build the culture. And we're not there yet. Someone asked me one day, I said, well, where do you think we are along this culture building thing? I said, I'd give us about a, a two. And, and they were shocked. They said, why? And I said, well, let's think about performance management for a, for a moment. We just rolled out our performance management system. And, um, and I give everybody about a C minus in terms of how well we did. Because we were afraid to tell people the truth. <laughs> we didn't have great objectives because we were new. And we weren't managing performance against those objectives as well as we could. And we didn't differentiate performance as well as we could have. And they were shocked by that. But it's a journey, right? It's a learning. And it takes years to put some of this, place in, uh, some of this stuff in place. So, um, and it's commitment. It's a relentless commitment to doing it. And so, you know, every webcast we have, we talk about our values, our culture, the things that we're trying to do. And so as I reflect, um, you know, we've made significant progress as an organization. Um, we've got a lot more to do, but we have huge challenges in front of us. But what an exciting place to be. You know, when people come and interview with us, I tell them, I said, you know, we're a great organization, but it's not for the weak of heart. <laughs> <laughs> because we've got so much to do, and we're building as we're going, as we're integrating. And there's not a lot, there, not everybody can deal with that. They need structure, they need process. Well, we're building the structure, we're building the process as we're integrating. So it's a great, exciting place to be, but it's not for the weak of heart. <laughs> you know, um, over the course of the last uh, week, I've had a lot of questions about, you know, how do you do this? I gotta watch my time. How do you do this? Um, you know, and it is all about leadership. And so um, at the expense of not going too long here, you know, I wanted to share with you some of the key learnings I've had about leadership um, because I, I think leadership can be very powerful and you've got to figure out your own, your own view on leadership and there's no one, one right answer, but I'd like to share with you a few of uh, my experiences that really shaped me, um, you know, in terms of my leadership style and what I believe to be important. You know, I, I go back to, I, I was roughly in my late 30s and I was in a business of, of international paper, and I, um, it was uh, about a $150 million business. And it was a small global business. We had operations outside the U.S. as well. Um, and I was a senior leader in that business, and, um, and I finally got to be the general manager of the business. And I had two weeks of pure euphoria. <laughs> you know, wow, I made it. <laughs> Look at this, I made it. I'm now the GM, I have responsibility for all this. And those two weeks were very short-lived. <laughs> of being euphoric. <laughs> I realized after two weeks, I said, oh my God, I got an underperforming business. And then I thought, why do I have this huge sense of responsibility that I didn't feel just two weeks ago as a senior leader in this company? And then I was scared. And then I thought to myself, why do I feel different today as, a, as the top person, and I didn't feel that way before, just two weeks earlier, and it dawned on me that I didn't feel like I could impact the future of the company. Now think about that. That's when I figured out what engagement was about. You know, companies talk about engagement all the time, but it's really helping people figure out how do they impact the results of the company and what role are they playing in that impact. 
And so that when they come to work every day, they know their work is being valued, they know they're making a difference. The other key thing I learned in that role is I was out on the shop floor. It was a heavy manufacturing organization. And I, I walked up to a, a female operator. She was a, a, a female operator, which, you know, back then, I won't, I, that was not that long ago. <laughs> um, I, I went up to her and I asked her how things are going, and she looked at me, and this was a single parent, a single mom. And she said, well, Mary, am I going to be able to make my mortgage payment next month? And I thought to myself, you know, up until then, I think it was largely about me. <laughs> And I realized the real responsibility of leaders. And it's not about you. It's not about you, the individual. It's about what you're doing for everyone else to be successful. You're there to help the organization and to help the people to succeed. And those leaders who make it about themselves, inevitably, they will never be as good. The organization will never be as strong. But that resonated with me because I realized, now that doesn't mean you don't make tough choices that impact people's lives, but you will think twice about it and you'll make your choices and decisions for the right reason. You know, I was then moved into another role with International Paper and you mentioned it, I, I became the head of our pulp, our pulp business. And um, you, know, I, you know, sometimes things are a blessing and a curse. You know, this business was losing $12 million a month. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I said. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and I came in and I didn't know anything about the business and I thought, well, the first thing we need to do is figure out our strategy. And so a few of us got together and we worked on a strategy. I went to one of the colleagues who had been there for a while and I said, I said, Bruce, what do you think about the strategy? And he says, it's a great strategy. And I said, great. He said, and it's the same one we've had for the last five years. <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh. I said, what happened? And he said, we never executed it. So there's a lesson to be learned about courage of execution. And you know what, and, it, and it's hard, and it's risky, but you have to have courage to execute and, um, and have that vision. And too often, people lack the courage to go forward and execute a strategy. Today, International Paper is still executing that strategy. And it, just a few weeks ago, they acquired formerly somebody's pulp business um, in Fluff Pulp. That was a strategy that we worked on going all the way back to 2001. And I still have the documents to prove it. <laughs> um, and so it was all about, um, all about a strategy. And, and then also um, and executing that strategy. But the other thing I learned is I, was, I had a P&L responsibility for a $2 billion business. It's a big business, global business. But I didn't manage one aspect of manufacturing or the supply chain. And I had to learn how to get things done through other people. And that's a very powerful skill as a, as a leader is to get things done through other people. Because it's never about what you personally do as you get higher in the organization. It's about the success you help others achieve. And, and I think that's very, very important. And what that brought to me is a lesson around you don't have to have command and control to be successful. And that collaboration can work and it's not about just pure command and control. Then International Paper asked me to go to run Europe. This was a $2 billion base business in eight countries, and we were about to head into a negotiating a joint venture in Russia, and it was the largest joint venture in Russia outside of oil and gas. And we had four Russian oligarch partners that we negotiated with, and I was always the only woman in the room. <laughs> And, um, but you know, in essence, we ended up with almost a $5 billion in Europe and Russia operating eight different countries and really diverse countries from Morocco to Russia to Turkey to Western Europe, Eastern Europe. And I learned a lot in that role. Um, I learned a lot and you know, one of the key things I took away, it was about, about teams. And as leaders, you need to ask yourself, do you want a team of leaders who are great individuals or do you want a leadership team? And there's a difference. Because the leadership team owns the whole. A team of leaders owns their piece. And there is a difference. And if you can create a leadership team, which by the way is a lot more work as an executive, it is a lot more work to have a leadership, a leadership team than individual leaders that you manage one off. It requires complete transparency. It requires trust. It requires the leader to give the power to the team. 
And so I will sit in team meetings, and I may not agree with the thing my team wants to do, but if most of them say this is what we're gonna, we need to do, I have to allow us to do it. And, um, and so you gotta have a lot of confidence, <laughs> trust, um, but you gotta be transparent, and, you, and you've gotta be able and willing to share the power. And I learned the things that we could do as a leadership team in Europe and we took the performance of that region from the bottom quartile of international paper companies to the top in just three years. And that I give credit to the team too. And I also learned about diversity. You know, we spoke and what real diversity meant. You know, we spoke, I think it was 30 different languages in our headquarters. Think about that. Think about the French working with the Germans and the, and the Russians and the, and the Polish. And, and that was the kind of diversity we had on our team. And what I learned is, is that people, diversity is developing uh, perspective. It's about perspective. And what do people bring to the party? It's not just about gender or race. It's about perspective. It's where you came from. What have you learned over time? All of the, but you know, by that nature, you know, you end up with a very diverse set of people and teams. If you appreciate that diversity that comes and the perspective that comes with diversity, and so I learned a lot um, about diversity and adapting and, and learning. And then when I came back into the U.S., they asked me to lead Expedex, was, which was too a troubled business. And the one thing my takeaway on, on leading Expedex is when you're headed into significant change, check the readiness of your organization, especially your leadership. And make sure your leadership is ready to lead that change. Because if they're not, you could end up being derailed and quite honestly, it was one of the first times in my career where I actually thought I maybe have tipped over an organization I wasn't sure we could recover. And it was because the leadership wasn't ready and the organization wasn't ready. And so when you're gonna drive massive change, make sure the organization is ready. And you know what? I was able to take all those things to do what I'm doing today. And so I'm gonna stop there <laughs> and open it up for questions. <laughs> yeah, we, um, <coughs> So wait just a second, let the microphone reach you. We podcast all of these so you can enjoy them at a future date. Um, the microphone will be circling around, so just raise your hand and uh, we'll get one to you right away. I have one comment. Thank you for all those uh, wonderful words. I'll make a plug for uh, UGA since I went, I, I got my MBA here and I did a program. They have a, a class called Leading to Change. Yes. That's being taught here. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mary. Uh, Where are we? Oh, okay. Here, sorry. And what's uh, your name? We should give you Nick your Hendricks. Name. Nick, uh, okay. You, know, you talked about leadership and leadership team. And something I'm interested in is, is during meetings, during a leadership team meeting, do you have a specific uh, route you take in every meeting that kind of governs uh, the direction you go within the meeting or uh, something of that nature? Um, yeah, we always, um, I believe in structure and process. Um, you know, and, and so we always have agendas. We always know whether we've got to make a decision or not. Um, we will often have heated debates. Um, but yes, we have a, a full agenda. We, we actually invite people to come in and present to us as a leadership team. And so it's a combination of uh, education, alignment, decision making, and forming. Um, and, and we all know when, what, what any one agenda is, what's the purpose of that agenda. Um, and you know all that stuff comes in in advance. We do pre-reads um, to try and be effective. And um, but we will have heated debates as well. And one of the things as a leader is you got to encourage people to speak their mind. And that's and that can really be hard. Um, but you've got to. I, I remember one of the, our new team members. Um, he had only worked with me for six months. And when I hired him, he said to me, he said, you know. This was six months in. He said, you know, I, I know you said that I could speak my mind and there wouldn't be negative ramifications. I wasn't sure I believed you, but I can see it happens. <laughs> you know, you've got to give them a license to disagree with you. And if you don't do that, people will be fearful. But you've got to give them a license to disagree and that there are no ramifications for disagreeing and uh, negative ramifications. Mm -hmm. Mary, um, my name is Vicki Dorsey. I'm the director of alumni at the College of Family and Consumer Sciences. Mm -hmm. And what is your favorite leadership book that you would recommend that we share with our students? 
in oh our family. Oh my gosh, I don't have one. You don't have a favorite? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe I should write a book. <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> I honestly don't. You know, there's a lot of different books out there um, on, on a lot of, you know, different types of leadership and so forth. You know, I, I just think that there's, um, you know, there's a number of learnings um, uh, that you can grasp onto, but I don't have one. Okay. Really, um, I wish I did, but I didn't. And again, you know, maybe I should write one sometime. But, um, but I don't have one because you know I think you can learn leadership. Most importantly, you can learn how to be a good leader. It's not sometimes books do say it's innate, you know, but it really isn't. You can learn to be a good leader, um, and so there's a lot of stuff out there that can help you do that. Mary, I, I appreciate your comments on um, your culture, uh, corporate culture, but I can't imagine, you know, the difficulty of, of bringing this to uh, such an organization size as yours. So I'm curious, what is your strategy to establish corp, uh, cultural norms all the way down to the most remote employee, the truck driver, who has very little contact with the home office? And yeah. Well, so first of all, you can imagine. Um, it, let's talk about the culture of the two companies for just a moment. One came from a, a manufacturing organization um, that's a hundred years old, you know, and so you know they it was different. One came from pi private equity and o was owned by private equity for twelve years. Can you imagine the differences in culture between that kind of background? You know, we do a number of things, but you know, it always starts at the top, right? <laughs> And I have to confess, I, I, you know, first of all, as leaders, you know, you pick talent. Um, I was 70% right. I have 10 direct reports. I have three new direct reports. <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to be perfect. And I can honestly tell you those three new direct reports, those three direct reports that are not with us today, it was all about values. And that was tough choices to make, especially at this level. But you have to walk the talk. People see it, they notice it, and they know that if I'm willing to make that commitment, um, that they need to be able to make that commitment. So it is holding people accountable. One of the things we rolled out with our performance management system is it's not only what you do, but it's how you do it. And so we have a set of five core values, and how do you get your work done? So that, that was new for us this year, and uh, we're going for our, through our first mid-year performance assessment, and, and we're rating people on how did you get your work done? You know, was it teamwork, collaboration? We made every employee put um, a, a development on their own personal development of collaboration this year. You know, and so it's forcing it. And you know, in addition to that, you know, we, we talk about it every day. You know, we've got our, our, our mission posters everywhere. Every time I show up at any town hall, any webcast, right, Ed, Ed's my, <laughs> he's my helper, <laughs> along with some other great people we have here in the back um, <laughs> that help me. Um, and, and I talk about it every meeting. You know, I've, there's been instances I'll, I'll share with you. We had a situation with a group where the leader of that group was exhibiting some of the worst behaviors. We worked with him for over a year, finally had enough. I actually intervened myself. And, um, <laughs> <coughs> and I went to that organization in front of 100 people and spent an hour talking in a town hall talking about values and culture. And they knew why that leader was no longer there when I got done. I didn't have to say a word about why he left. So it's everything we do every day. And it's talking about every day. It's everything you take action on. You explain why, why it's connected to a culture. So it's not easy. And people don't, one of the things I realize is people don't connect actions that you're taking to a culture building. Because it's so far, it's so hard. You know, you know yeah, you know, you're making us do you know, this performance management. What it, you know, this is so hard. Why do we have to do that? Well, it goes directly to building our culture. You know, so you got to connect the dots for people. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Mary, I think it's so interesting to understand a little bit more about who people are and, you know, what, what journey took you here, how you're in front of us today. To the extent that, that you're willing, would you, would you share with us a little bit, like, how did you grow up? How did you get into this business? What led you through college <laughs> into, this, into this world of packaging into a 30 language headquarters? <laughs> Uh, it's remarkable, actually. <laughs> um, if, I, if my parents were still alive, they'd be shocked. 
Um, <laughs> Um, believe it or not, um, I come from very proudly, very humble beings. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. I had four brothers and three sisters. I didn't, I, I didn't have enough confidence to go to college out of high school. I started college at the age of 21. And I graduated at the age of 26. And um, I just took every opportunity I could to learn. And I had turning points in my career that molded me. And, um, and so, you know, I'm, pr I'm proud of that, and um, I, I wake up every day wondering what happened. <laughs> 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 I do, um, but you know what? There's a message in there for everyone, right? Um, you know, do, do what you can do, constantly learn, do it for the right reasons. Um, you know, people ask me, well, did you aspire to do this? And I'll, I'll tell you some, I got great funny stories and lessons learned, but, you know, when you get out of college, you know, and there's, how many college students are in here? or in, work in their MBAs or whatever. Okay, so you, you're gonna get out of school and you say, you know, you're the smartest person in the room. <laughs> you know, because you just got your MBA or you just got out of college. And you know, I, I was the same way in my first, you know, nine months. <laughs> and I realized I wasn't gonna be CEO in five years. <laughs> and then, you know, it, and then it became daunting to know and learn what you have to know to be a CEO of a company. And so then I got more realistic expectation um, and I decided I had a lot to learn. And I took every opportunity to learn. I took sideway moves, I took backward moves, just to learn. I share with you, I, I went one point in time in my career, went five years without any salary increase. Because I had to learn some things. And the job was below where I was. And so I did that. And that sometimes can be risky. So you can never look at the very next job you got to be thinking about what's really important to you. And what was really important to me was to never be bored. I never wanted to stay in one functional area for my <laughs> entire career. And so when you read off some of the things that I've done, I've worked in every function of the organization, um, including R&D, managing an R&D organization. I don't have a technical background to operations, but I've never worked directly in IT. I'm technically challenged <laughs> in IT. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've never worked directly in finance, but I have very strong financial acumen. So, so it's a lot of different things, but it's constantly learning and growing. And, and you know, f don't focus on the next job. Focus on what you can learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I found it refreshing, some of the things you said. Like, I found myself after two weeks in this role going, oh, <laughs> goodness, what have I gotten myself into? Yes. Uh, you clearly have a high emotional IQ. Mm -hmm. um, and as you've talked about your organization and the uh, – annual reviews and those sorts of things. How do you handle failure? There's plenty of opportunities for failure, particularly in the situation your company's in of bringing together two groups and mm -hmm. starting up a Fortune 500. Yeah. I'm curious to hear. You know, I look at, um, first of all, I have failed. I don't want to say fail. I've had setbacks. It is failure at some point, but it's what you do with the failure. You know, I, you know, I tell our teams all the time, you know what, you're not going to get it right all the time. There's no way. You know, we're gonna make, and you're gonna make mistakes along the way. There's no way, especially if we're pushing talent development, especially. Because we're gonna put, and I was in this situation, you know, what did I know about going to operate in Europe? I couldn't speak a foreign language. <laughs> I didn't understand the cultures. You know, I grew up on a dairy farm, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so, and, and I can tell you, there were times in my career where I, I didn't know if I was gonna make it. But it's stamina and, and courage to keep going and learning. And, but when you're with teams, you gotta acknowledge, especially if you're gonna be developing people and putting them into stretch assignments, you gotta acknowledge that they're not gonna be great coming out of the, out of the shoot with that new job. And you've gotta accept that and expect that people are going to, to, to have setbacks. Um, and that's okay. It's what they do with it. On the other hand, if they have failure or setbacks because of bad behavior, I have no tolerance for it. <laughs> you know, because that's cultural. Um, and, and so, you know, we've, you know, a lot of people have left the organization. I had one gentleman come in my office one day, and he was a senior leader, and he says to me, um, Mary, can I never get ahead because I came from this other organization? And, um, and I said, no, John, you're never gonna get ahead because you behave badly. <laughs> you just behave badly. And, um, and I said, until you make a choice 
that you want to be a part of this culture, you're never going to get ahead. Well, he left shortly after that, and that's the right answer. He didn't want to, he wanted to be in a command and control environment, did not want to work collabor collaboratively across the organization, and that's just not who we're going to be. So it depends on what causes the failure um, <laughs> or the setback, but you have to be able and willing to accept that, that learning um, and make sure that you never set people up to fail. Um, and, and so, for example, we move people into stretch jobs. Um, you know, we have great general manager jobs, and we move people into s in, in roles that have never been a general manager before, and, and yet then you've got to look at things like who's the team under them, who's the team above them. What can we do to make sure they succeed? So, but you're going to have setbacks. I can tell you I've had a number of them. How do you think I learned so much? <laughs> you learn from your mistakes. Hey, Mary, this is Jacob Pro. Um, yes. You mentioned that 50% of mergers don't work. How would you rate your merger between these two companies? Um, too soon to tell. We are, we're off to a great start. There's no question uh, in my mind. We're off to a great start. But we're only halfway through our integration. This is a really pivotal year for us because um, the, um, you know, I, I actually thought the people stuff was going to be harder than what it was. And, and the teams, I'm so proud of our organization. You know, people wanted this to succeed and, and work. And so I couldn't be more proud of our teams. Um, but we have some huge heavy lifting in front of us. Um, we've got massive systems integration. Um, and, and consolidation, because right now we're still operating on two of everything. <laughs> and when you go through that level of change, so what's entailed in that? We've got to redefine every process in the company. We've got to build the IT infrastructure to support that. We've got to do all the change management to make it work. And we've got over 8,000 people and 180 locations. And so the heavy lifting is, is still in front of us. And we have to do that in when we're still 60% uh, um, of our revenue, fortunately only 30% of our earnings is in structural decline in the industry of print and publishing. <coughs> and so we've got to do all of this and grow in our, in our other two core businesses. And, um, and so, I don't know, I hope I can come back here in two years and and tell you that we're an incredible success. But the fact is, is that we've been very successful today because of our teams, but we still have a lot of heavy lifting to do. So, yep. Hey, good morning, Mary. Charles Crosby, I'm in the construction industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, both of our industries and a lot of other industries depend on not only the the college uh, educated folks, but also the skilled trades. And yes. One of the things I spend a lot of time in is working with uh, organizations that promote uh, skilled trades to middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. What uh, are y'all doing in Veritev to promote that and support that? And then what would you recommend or like to see happen in the education system to help better deliver uh, skilled individuals for both our industries and all yeah. other industries? Well, I'll start by saying I'm generally frustrated with the education system across North America. <laughs> That's a bold statement sitting in front of this group. <laughs> um, I think we've, in too, especially in some of the higher education, we've, we've, we've lost sight of what's important in terms of teaching student teaching. And I don't think there's enough business influence in the education because kids come out of school not knowing what career opportunities exist, mm -hmm. what those jobs really mean. Um, and sometimes we put too much value on the higher ed versus the technical skill development. And, and I think we could do a better job helping people understand where do they belong in that spectrum and, and where they should land based on their skills and, and capabilities. Um, and so, and I think, so I, I think there's a lot of opportunity, you know, to in the, in the education system overall um, with partnerships with business and, and other things. You know, to date, I gotta be honest, we haven't done a lot. Um, and, and, and just because of where we are, you know, in in our um, progression and in our journey. Um, but, but I think that a lot can be done. And, um, and we, we recognize the value of the differences. Uh, last week I was interviewing with Fortune 500 and we were talking about the company and, and the woman said to me, um, she says, wow, you're like, you're like the great American public company. 
he said, you, you hire workers in your warehouse um, that have high school education. You know, you hire skilled trades, you hire MBAs, you know, you hire college graduates. It's like, you have the full spectrum of talent. And I said, yes, we're a very wholesome company. <laughs> And, um, you know, and, and you know, we, we need to value all of those roles. Um, but um, so we haven't done enough yet. Uh, but what I will tell you that one of the things that I've been learning uh, more and more is that more and more people want to come to work with companies that have a strong culture and have strong values. Um, and it's not just about the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Mary. Jenny Nye here. Thank you for sharing this morning. Um, you mentioned the journey that you're on and through phase the second phase with integration. Uh, can you share a little bit more about what the next phase with acceleration and transformation means to you yeah. and to Veritas? Yeah. Um, okay, so I can't share too much because we haven't announced anything to our shareholders yet. Um, but let me tell you the work we're doing to figure that out and, and my, my, my vision. So, you know, we have a company here that has so much potential. It's mind-boggling to me the potential that this organization has because we have great people, we have great assets. We've got, even in spite of the merger, we've got, we're in a good place from our balance sheet um, in spite of how young we are as a company. And so we're in the process right now today. Um, so, so you got to set your priorities right because you can't do everything at once. I mean, we need to figure out how to pay people, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but as of the end of last year, you know, we started out, I hired a, a chief strategy officer who reports directly to me, and we're building a team, um, an, uh, a big corporate development team um, with strategy, M&A, um, and, um, uh, and, and business development, new business development capabilities. Um, and as part of that, uh, competitive capa analysis capabilities and analytics. So we're right now building that capability. Um, but we, you know, we're on our way um, to hopefully talk about um, where we think we can take this company longer term um, over the course of the next 12 months. You know, what I envision um, is, is that today we're largely a products company. You know, we buy products, we sell products. A small portion of our business is services. I do see us evolving more and more into the services area um, and, 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 and taking what we do today and adding services onto that where there's a higher value attached um, to that. Um, but I see us evolving um, into more of a service area. And over the course of time, we've got to change our mix in our company um, to, because we know we've got a structurally declining segment. Um, and, and so we, over the course of time, we've got to change the makeup of the company over the course of time. You know, so, you know, you know five years from now, maybe somewhere in the range of five to ten. You know, we're, today we're a small cap company. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, our market cap today is only about $600 million. We've got a huge revenue, um, small market cap. You know, our first goal is to become a billion dollar market cap. Um, and that's a milestone where I'm going to celebrate, you know, as we get there. Um, and so we also have some financial goals that we know and that we need to recognize. We've got to get our top line moving more effectively. And so, so we have a, a quasi vision of where, where we're going, but it's still work in progress. It is going to require us to make material changes in how we go to market and our capabilities, though. Hi, Mary. I'm Braden Barra. So first of all, thanks for being here. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, so thanks for taking the time. So my question is more around the topic of culture, culture. Um, mm -hmm. that you talked about. So I can imagine that bringing together many of the companies that you've brought together that have been around for quite some time, you're dealing with the multi-generational workforce. So to try to work toward your goals and some of your, um, you know, the, the trends or, or what you're trying to achieve as a company, how are you dealing with that multi-generational workforce? Folks that have been in the business as for a long time, our business for a long mm -hmm. time, versus the newer generation right. that may be more embraced, able to embrace technology, innovation, and that. Right. Yeah. Yet. You know, there is no um, doubt um, we are in a phase where, because of the legacy of the two companies. Um, our workforce is, is, an, is a more mature workforce. That's the proper language to use, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Experienced and mature workforce. Um, and, you know, we, <laughs> we are bringing in um, a, a lot of um, talent um, into the organization. And it's actually quite surprising to me um, because, you know, the people have been around for a while. They actually want to nurture these folks. 
and, and learn from them. Um, and, and so, you know, we found that to be, you know, quite successful in our sales organization, for example, where we've got these sellers that have been selling for 20, 30 years, and they want to nurture the, the younger people coming in um, and help them succeed. Um, and, you know, and so there, it's, it's not actually not been as difficult, you know, as, as I thought. But the other thing we're doing is we got a piece of our business uh, that is so unlike the rest of our business that we're bringing talent in, um, and then we will bring them into other parts of the business as they grow and develop. So we have this uh, or part, it's called Veritative Logistics Services. And um, it, it's, un it's unlike anything else in the company where, you know, you think of um, old school warehousing, you know, distribution, trucks, trailers. Um, this is a team of, I think we're over 100 people today um, that are sitting at computers and are trading. They're trading freight, freight brokerage. And, um, and they're all generally young people because they know how to use computers better. <laughs> <laughs> and they understand the technology. Um, and, um, and, we're, and, and that's really been a tremendous pool for us. Um, and then as they, as they come up, we will bring that organization into the other part of the organization and start to transform the company from a talent standpoint over the course of time. So we have a pocket, almost like an experimental pocket in our business today. And it's a completely different feeling when you walk into that part of our organization too. You, you look around and like, are these kids even out of school yet? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, it's, it's very high energy and, um, and it's like a trading floor. It's like the old trading floor in the New York Stock Exchange. And so, you know, it's about bringing in, it, it's about bringing in people, helping them feel a part of the team mentoring people, which we're not very good at yet, but we do do some of that. Um, and, and there is a difference. Um, but surprising to me, and this has been surprising to some of our leadership, um, you know, even um, our more um, senior people have said to me, said, Mary, you know, I didn't understand all this values and culture stuff, and I really didn't even believe in it, but I'm beginning to see that people really do care. People care. They want to be proud of who they work for. I don't care how old you are, what job you're in, you want to be proud of the company that you work for and what they stand for. And, um, and I think that's a real powerful aspect of what we're trying to do too. All right. Well, listen, thank, thank you for you your very time. Very <laughs> don't, don't, don't run away just oh. yet. Um, okay. Because I do have something for you as soon as I can find it. Uh, oh yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. First and foremost. <laughs> now, despite it's look, it's our tradition to uh, to provide a keepsake for all of our speakers. Oh, wonderful. This is a glass sculpture by an artist, Loretta Eby. Oh, um, thank you so much for spending You're time. You're welcome. With us. Thank you. Great. Yeah. It. Thank you, everyone. I'll everyone, just a quick reminder uh, on your way out: parking validation at the uh, at the desk. Have a safe, wonderful, hopefully cool. Summer. We'll uh, we'll see you guys in August. Uh, take care and thanks again. Oh, great.